They came from different lands, all facing an uncertain future. English and Ashanti, Mendi and Portuguese, German and Igbo, Fanti and Spaniard, French and Angolan, some seeking adventure or riches or religious freedom. Others were captives, bartered and sold like cattle. Together they would build a nation and struggle over the very meaning of freedom and create the America we have inherited today. I don't think you can understand race relations today without understanding slavery. Even though people will say, I didn't do it, my father didn't do it, even my grandparents, they didn't do it. One of the things that's essential is to know that slavery is not just a Southern institution, it's an American institution. What evolves in North America is the belief system where to be black meant to be a slave and to be a slave meant to be black. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Why is it self-evident? It came from God. They're inalienable. Government secures them. Remarkable document. Didn't apply to black folks. And the man who wrote them for those words Thomas Jefferson kept slaves. He also wrote sometime later to a friend, if there is a just God, we're going to pay for this. Slavery and freedom existed side by side in this country. I think the issue is, did it always have to be that way? And the early history of America indicates that it probably did not. in the colony that was called Virginia, in the county of Northampton. After a season of disputes, a white man and a black man went into the field and there divided their crop and their land. According to the testimony given in court, the man named Anthony the Negro said, Mr. Taylor and I have divided our corn and I am very glad of it, for now I know mine own ground. In April 1607, three vessels carrying 105 colonists landed at a place they named Jamestown at the edge of the Virginia wilderness. They hoped to establish the first permanent English settlement in the New World. There, Englishmen would build a new promised land, the brave new world that their poet Shakespeare dreamed, a free land built by free men. The dreams were utopian initially. Colonies without coercion, without oppression, where each man would be regarded as free and equal. There was a lot of idealism, I think, in the, uh, in, among, in the early settlements in, uh, in the New World. Uh, a lot of idealism, which I think didn't didn't stand much to the test of uh, of 
of experience. Englishmen believed that their God had ordained them to spread his word and that they had the God-given right to drive out all unwilling to live according to English law. But in the first two years, the colonists learned that they were unprepared for life in the American wilderness. The fourth day of September died Thomas Jacob Sargent. The fifth day there died Benjamin Beast. Our men were destroyed with cruel diseases, of swellings, flixes, burning fevers, and by wars, and some departed suddenly. But for the most part, they died of mere famine. There were never Englishmen left in a foreign country in such misery as we were in this new discovered Virginia. George Percy, In 1609, 500 settlers lived in the Jamestown colony. By the spring of 1610, only 60 were left alive. About the latter end of August, a Dutch man-of-war arrived at Point Comfort. The commander's name, Captain Jope. He brought not anything but 20 and odd Negroes, which the governor bought in exchange for food. John Rolfe, Virginia colonist, In 1619, a year before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, a mystery ship appeared out of a violent storm off the Virginia coast. No one recorded the ship's name, but somewhere on the high seas, she had robbed a Spanish vessel of a cargo of Africans. In search of supplies, she traded the Africans for food. They had been baptized and given Christian names. As Christians, they could not be enslaved for life under English law. Like most Europeans in the colony, they were purchased to work as servants for a limited number of years. The new arrival supplied much needed labor for the tobacco crop that was making men rich. Settlers were planting tobacco in the streets of Jamestown, carving plantations out of the surrounding wilderness, and shipping some 60,000 pounds a year back to England. Once tobacco is established as a viable commodity, then the more land you control, the bigger profits you can make. And in order to make those profits, you need more labor, and you look for that labor wherever you can find it. Well, the colony builders uh, initially intended to rely almost exclusively on white indentured servants as a labor force to cultivate the crops that were being grown in Virginia, principally tobacco. And in order to create these raw materials or goods, you often needed labor. The world the Africans entered was controlled by wealthy Englishmen and populated by the English poor, most under the age of 25. In return for passage to Virginia, they had traded four to seven years of their labor. They were bound to a master by an indenture form, a contract that defined length of service and the conditions of servitude. Most were promised freedom dues after their service, a bushel of corn, a new suit of clothes, and 100 acres of land. Under Virginia's head right system, 
a planter was entitled to 50 acres of land for each servant brought into the colony. The issue always was how long that indenture would be and, and under what conditions you would be forced to work. At its best, it was a short, friendly apprenticeship. You know, at its worst, it was a, it was a long and exploitative situation in which you might die before you ever obtained your freedom. By 1622, 3,000 new settlers drawn by the opportunities of the tobacco boom had arrived in Virginia. Two years later, the first Negro child was born in the colony. He was named William Tucker, after a Virginia planter. The prosperity that began in 1619 and the dream of a new Eden, of people peacefully coexisting under English law, was seriously threatened in March 1622. On Good Friday, some 30 nations of the Powhatan Confederacy, angered by English violation of land treaties, attacked without warning and attempted to drive the English back into the sea. Along the James River, the Indians killed 350 colonists. On the Bennett Plantation alone, 52 people died. Among the 12 who survived was a man named Antonio. Here's an individual that arrives as one of the first African Americans in the history of what became the United States. He does what almost no one in early Virginia managed to do, and that is live everyone that's dying of disease, of violence, and since he's lucky. He had been brought to the colony the year before to work tobacco along the James River. His name appeared in the 1625 Virginia census as Antonio a Negro. He was listed as a servant. He comes to Virginia, finds a society that is just developing, He's getting in on the ground floor, as it, as it were. Um, I don't know if he was able to immediately envision that there would be opportunities for him here that uh, weren't available elsewhere. I don't know that anyone could have foretold that. When Antonio arrived, the laws of Virginia did not as yet define racial slavery. They governed only the status of servants. At some point, Antonio changed his name to Anthony Johnson and married a Negro servant named Mary from a neighboring plantation. She bore him four children. By 1640, it is clear Anthony and Mary were no longer servants. They had acquired their own modest estate on Virginia's eastern shore. As Johnson prospered, as he obtained land and cattle, he also acquired dependent laborers. What made all of this society go was property. Your identity in the society was determined rather obviously by the amount of land, the amount of labor that you owned. Anthony Johnson was enjoying privileges belonging to a free Englishman. He claimed five workers as head rights and expanded his property to 250 acres along the Pongateague Creek. At least some of his workers were white. By 1650, Anthony was one of 400 black people in Virginia out of a population of almost 19,000 settlers. In Northampton County, where Johnson lived, nearly 20 African men and women were free, and 13 owned their own homes. As Anthony Johnson is accumulating property, it seems as though his situation is secure. You get a sense of this individual, this black man, being treated like any white planter, and his wife and daughters being treated like the wife of a planter. At an early moment, when men and women were sorting themselves out, when the rules, the etiquette of race, labor, were not so clear, 